Hello, and welcome back to Making Sense of Money. I'm Andrew Pellegrini. Last episode, we celebrated International Women's Day by talking to my colleague Ramya about her experiences teaching financial literacy to women in India. It was very interesting to get kind of a different perspective on this topic, especially from my colleague Ramya. So feel free to check it out if this is something that intrigues you. And I'm Nikki Jankola Shanks. I loved having Ramya on. It was it was just cool to learn about her experiences. So make sure you check it out. Today, Andrew and I are going to be talking about a very interesting concept, how you can spend your money and have an impact on the world at large. Andrea is going to be leading a webinar on this very topic on March 29th at noon. So I'm going to spend today interviewing her to learn about how our spending can make a difference. We're also going to put a link in the show notes for the webinar if you want to learn even more about this topic. To start us off, Andrea, what is conscious consumerism? So conscious consumerism is a term used to describe this phenomenon where people make spending choices that align with their values. This might be by like buying ethical products or avoiding unethical companies or boycotting purchases completely. So by engaging in this type of behavior or these multiple types of behavior, consumers are essentially voting with their dollars, which makes an impact on the market that they're making purchasing decisions in and therefore the economy and the world, right? So values play a huge role in conscious consumerism. Can you give us some examples on how values impact that? How, how do how are those two things related? Right. So one of one of the key components of conscious consumerism is the ethics piece. Ethical purchases, ethical products, avoiding unethical companies, and ethics are related to your values for the most part. And and values are a little bit of an abstract concept. They they tend to differ widely from person to person. They can also change depending on the situation or your mood, what day it is, things you may hit, your stress levels. There's so many different things that can impact kind of how you prioritize your values. And you can look up these really long lists of what of what values exist or inventories that that can help you assess your own values too. But to give you some examples, authority is sometimes something that people value. And maybe you're someone who values having authority, but maybe only in crisis situations. You don't you could care less in other types of situations. So that would be a situational type of of value, or that's how you prioritize that particular value. You might be someone who values both self-discipline and self-indulgence, but it uh, manifests in different ways for different people. So for instance, maybe you are someone who engages in their value of self-indulgence by taking yourself out to ice cream after completing so many workouts correctly over a, a period of time, or your your self-discipline doesn't come out as your workout routine. Maybe it's your diligence and efficiency at work. And that is how you kind of manifest your your self-discipline value. Some people might value independence or curiosity. They might value having choice or access to choice. They may value nature. That's kind of a concrete concept, right? Compared to these more abstract concepts, they may value loyalty and like their spouse, obviously, that's pretty common value <laughs> value to have. Uh, maybe they value responsibility or they value humility. And a lot of these values also relate to our identity. So when we think about what our values are personally, what makes us us, that is, is commonly part of uh, like the collective values of a particular person and how it correlates to their identity, which it makes sense when we're talking about conscious consumerism, how identifying our values might help us be more intentional in doing behaviors or engaging in behaviors that show the world our identity or help us feel more like ourselves. 
that all makes sense. I mean, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about values that matter to me and how that it would apply. So you and I did an inflation episode and we talked a lot, but not just the inflation ep- episode. We've talked a lot about CPI, the consumer price index, and a lot of different podcasts. So while I was doing some research for this podcast, I actually came across something that was called CCI, the C- Conscious Consumerism Index. So since 2013, Good Must Grow, a socially responsible marketing firm, has conducted a survey to try and gauge how important conscious consumerism is to people. Now, again, I want to stress this is just one company. Um, It's not, you know... They, they, I think they interviewed the, it said about a thousand people for this, but I just thought some of the findings that they had were interesting in related, in relation to our podcast. So they calculate the score by evaluating the importance consumers place on purchasing from socially responsible companies, actions taken to support such products or services, and future intent to increase the amount they spend with responsible organizations. So just a few interesting tidbits from the CCI. The record low was 39 in 2020, which just making sense, you know, 2020, we were all just trying to get by, right? (laughs) There were shortages everywhere. There was, I'm sure people were not researching everything. It was like, I need that toilet paper. I don't care where it comes from. That's the first thing I thought of. I was like, (laughs) people needed toilet paper and they did not care who they were buying it from. (laughs) Right. So like that finding to me was not at all shocking, right? The record high, on the other hand, was 51 in 2021. So it could be that people, maybe people were like, hey, things are starting to get a little bit back to normal now. I could, maybe that, you know, swung the other way. This past year, it did dip slightly to 48. And the report made a a very large point that this was due to the decrease in purchasing power among Americans. Inflation. Yep. (laughs) Tied to inflation. So due to things being more expensive and sometimes products that are more socially responsible are more expensive for that reason. Right. Um, So due to inflation, people may just couldn't always make that choice. And then I wanted to do some comparisons between 2013, which was the first year and 2022. In 2013, 60% of Americans believed it was important to support socially responsible products and services. But in 2022, that number rose to 67%. And the report made a statistical significance that even moving one point for them was considered significant due to what they were trying to measure. So measuring going up seven points in 10 years, I personally feel like I didn't know what socially responsible products and services were when you think about it. But now, yeah, right? Even if it's as simple as buying organic as opposed to a GMO type thing, right? Those those things weren't talked about as much. In 2013, 25% of Americans reported that they boycotted brands that were not socially responsible. And in 2022, that rose to 32%. I think that's significant. I think The thing that when I read that, that I automatically thought of 2013 to 2022, right? Like technology expanded so much in that time, right? Social media, like getting the word out that maybe this company is behaving in a way that I don't agree with and spreading that to friends and families and strangers, right? It was a, became a lot easier. That was the statistic that really drove that home for me that I was like, yeah, I bet you technology played a p- part in that. Well, and technology has made it easier to compare options, right? And so you have access to more choices because you're aware of more options. Yes. Very good point. And then I want to also talk, there was an area of decline, actually, from 2013 to 2022 that I found surprising. But then when I thought about it, I was like, okay. So in 2013, 89% of 
people thought that they were being green. I say think because that is a very high number. I think everybody wants to think that they're being green, you know, (laughs) but in 2022, only 81% of people said that. Now we could talk about that. Why did that go down? Like maybe because we know more now about what it means to be green. And we're like, "Eh, I don't really do as much as I thought I was doing. Same for, so reducing the consumption of gas, energy, and purchases. In 2013, 79% of people said that they did. And in 2022, only 66% of people. That one was a little bit harder for me to swallow because I was like, really? I feel like hybrid cars are more of a thing. The areas of decline were interesting to me. However, what I was going to say on that is I know a lot in very recent years has come up about recycling. For example, I know my in-laws, they are huge recyclers and their city actually is no longer doing recycling because of the way that their tiny town in Florida, like had to take their recycling to like, it was like a series of like, and then it ends up on the, in the ocean, you know, that their city decided it wasn't worth it. So I think that, that, stuff like that may also like, I know my in-laws are probably like, well, I'm not as green as I used to be, but that's also not my fault. (laughs) Yeah. I went to Maine last fall and the place we stayed at had previously had recycling and they said they were just waiting on the municipality to find a option for recycling again, because it literally was not available during the pandemic at all. And it was so costly that it wasn't going to be sustainable for that community. I actually had that thought too. I would like, if we could have like dug into the, if we were part of the people doing this interview, I would have asked some people like, are you harder in your, like, I know personally, we were not very green during the pandemic, just in terms of we were home. So we were watching a lot of TV. We were on our computer. You know what I mean? So like how much did that impact some of these answers that you're like, well, we were home. So I kept my heat a little bit higher because we were home during the day, you know, like stuff like that, that may factor in. I think also people are recognizing that they, there's only a tiny impact that individual consumers can make on going green. And so unless companies are making changes with their packaging options, with their recycling opportunities, depending on what state you're in, no matter what we do, it's not going to be a big enough impact because companies make the largest impact on being green or climate friendly or, you know, all these things that align with sustainable values. So, and then I'll end on this statistic because I think that that this kind of ties into what we were talking about technology earlier. Um, in 2013, only 6% of consumers trusted that brands who claim to be socially responsible actually were. And that number has increased to 18%. So again, I felt like that's kind of the exposure. You learn about stuff, you could look at more things and actually see labels on stuff that you may not, you you could do that research a little bit, I think, easier on your own. Again, just wanted to stress, this is just one survey. Um, I kind of just found some of the numbers interesting for us to talk about today. And we will put a link in the show notes to the survey in case people want to read more about that company and how they do, how they calculate the CCI. All right, Andrea. So let's say I wanted to do this. I wanted to be more conscious as I make my purchases. What do I do and how do I go about doing it? There are lots of ways to do it. I actually learned a lot from your conscious consumerism index because I had not run across that before. So that, I think that is very interesting. If, If we're thinking about like action items to be a more conscious consumer, there are a few steps you can take, right? One is reflecting on your values because if you can't identify what your values are, you can't really engage in behaviors that align with your values. So defining what's important to you, looking for opportunities to practice what that value is. You, you'll you probably have to do research on what you're already supporting with your dollars and your financial habits. And kind of see where maybe there's misalignment, maybe where 
You can change some of your regular spending habits to align better with your values. You might consider refraining from purchases if there's nothing that meets your needs and values, if it's an option, right? Well, I'm not saying starve yourself in order to align with your values if there's no organic options available. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying look, consider what your options are, consider if there's something you can go without not buying anything. You obviously want to revisit what your values are regularly because they can change over time. And you also want to revisit what your spending habits are to make sure that they, there continues to be alignment between the two because our options can change. Um, Nikki and I both talked about examples where people want to engage in recycling activities, but the recycling options are no longer available in those municipalities. So that is something where maybe you look at modifying your behaviors in other areas so that you can still engage in like green friendly or climate friendly or less waste activities to compensate a little bit for the recycling loss as an option. You also might consider practicing mindfulness to kind of help you be intentional with your purchasing decisions. Uh, mindfulness is something that that can sometimes help you be more aware of yourself, your thought processes, just engaging in and practicing mindfulness on a regular basis can be helpful for building skills that can help you in financial decision making, especially if it's in a particular area. Like maybe you are susceptible to FOMO decisions, fear of missing out on a particular sale or something. So <laughs> there, there's some conversations in the financial well-being industry around mindfulness and how that can help you be more aware of your habits, more aware of what drives your behaviors and help you kind of like bring it back, like check yourself before you go make a, a big decision that m you might regret later. I think that there's there's one aspect of, of these different steps of being a conscious consumer that's a little bit complicated. And I think Nikki touched on it earlier when we were talking about the, the CCI's change in consumers' trusts of brands who claim to be socially responsible. Even today, even though there's like things on labels and there's all these certifications, you still have to do a little bit of digging to do your due diligence on different companies or products that you want to support because these certifications are everywhere. There's all kinds of sustainable certifications. I'm not going to mention any because I don't want to dog on any of them. I haven't done my due diligence on every single one of them, but there's a whole bunch of them out there and they are not always transparent about their processes. You have to do a little bit more research to see how are they certifying these companies? Do they do site checks or is it just a paperwork trail, right? What kinds of consequences are in place for this particular product or service? Uh, legislation has changed a lot over the past 10 years. So that was probably one of the reasons why consumers are more trustworthy now of companies claiming to be socially responsible is because governments are forcing them to be. But there's also the this there's industry standards that may not be legislatively demanding, uh, but it may just be like these are the industry standards. And so that will change by industry, but not like across multiple industries or across multiple products. So that makes it more challenging in some ways, I think. And I think I already mentioned this, but when you're looking at certifications, it might be, especially if you're just looking for it on the label, it might be that that company just paid for the certification and fills out paperwork, but doesn't actually do what they say they're going to do. It, but you might have a company that has the same certification that actually does do what they say they're going to do. So that's what makes just using that as kind of a, an easy check, kind of a, a simple heuristic. Like a heuristic is 
habits that we engage in that makes things easier, like rules of thumb. So just looking for something with a specific certification when you're shopping for seafood, for instance, may not actually help you align your values with your your decision making. So you got to actually research stuff. That's what's the most difficult part of being a conscious consumer is the research piece. Yeah, I completely agree with you there, um, Andrea. I do think the re- the research piece, it takes time. Like, I'm not going to lie. You're not going to be able to look at it, something in the store and know, right? You're, you, there is that research part. So can you give us a few examples how someone would apply this type of thinking to their actual shopping? I think that's a, a, a great question, Nikki. So one of the things that I think is helpful is let's say you're you're shopping for a particular clothing item you want you need or want let's say I want a new hoodie right mine is getting a little ratty I want a new one has to I have one so I could boycott this situation but I want a new hoodie and so maybe I I search for multiple different types of hoodies from different companies and I want to engage in Specific things are important to me with this hoodie purchase. I want to know that the the company that I'm purchasing from is ethical. They treat their employees well. They don't engage in like polluting activities. Those are the things that are, they are clean. Those are things that are important to me. So that kind of limits where I'm going to shop for this hoodie. I also want to think about the cost because I'm a little bit frugal but I'm willing to pay a little bit more for better quality items. So it's kind of a balance there. So I'm going to look at the cost. I might even make a grid. So I have the item, uh, the company, the cost of the item, and then maybe elements of either the, the product or the company that I'm supporting with my purchase. Maybe I'm looking to support small business or I want to support local or I want a product that is sustainable or green. So those are things that I might be comparing across these different items that I'm looking at. And there might be situations where none of the items that I find ticks all my boxes. So I'm going to have to compromise on, do I go ahead and make the purchase just compromising and prioritizing what I value most is like, what, what are the things that I value most about this hoodie purchase? For instance, do I boycott this purchase completely? Cause I still, I do have a hoodie. It's just getting a little ratty. So what, what's the trade-off there? So that's kind of one example of, of how to comparison shop and consider your values and what your choices are based on kind of the the framework you've set up for yourself for a, a financial decision. Thank you, Andrew. I think that was really a great, great way to put, let us see the um, practice, all the things to, you could consider. So I thank you for that. All right. So we've talked about being a consumer in terms of buying things and spending money, but this type of thinking can uh, apply to investing as well. So let's start with SRI, otherwise known as socially responsible investing. What is this, Andrea? So SRI is is an acronym, obviously. It can be used for both socially responsible investing and sustainable, responsible, and impact investing. So it's, it's used to refer to a few different acronyms related to sustainable investing, basically. According to the U.S. Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investing, SRI is an investment discipline that considers environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria to generate long-term competitive financial returns and positive societal impact. So that is like their quote definition for it. The environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria is also referred to as ESG, and sometimes ESG and SRI are used interchangeably, uh, even though SRI is more of an investment discipline or method, and ESG is the criteria used within that particular method. So hopefully that 
provides a little bit of clarity between the two acronyms. Yes, because I, I personally sometimes get confused between SRI and, S and ESG. So it's more that SRI refers to the type of investing and ESG is what people consider if they want socially responsible investing, right? Basically, yeah. But it can be kind of used interchangeably depending on context. Because like I said earlier, the SRI also refers to sustainable, responsible, and impact investing. So that's like methodology related, environmental, societal, and corporate governance is spe more specific criteria looking at. And can you give us some examples of ESG? I can sure try. I, I'm not an expert on either SRI or ESG, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> so um, environmental criteria could include things like water use and conservation by a, a company or organization. It could look at sustainable natural resource use or agriculture. It might look at how a company handles pollution or toxics. Uh, it might consider clean technology and how that's leveraged either by the company or if you want to invest in a, a company that produces clean technology. It might also include concepts related to climate change or carbon use. And I think green green buildings, like people uh, organizations that are uh, doing new building development and focusing on green building technologies or use cases is something that's a factor in the environmental criteria of ESG. Social considers the more human elements of a company's practices. So it might include uh, human rights, right? Does the company support civil civil rights, human rights, um, what kinds of, of outreach do they do or what practices do they have in place to support human rights? It might be the avoidance of tobacco, tobacco or other harmful products that are known to the market. It might be that the company engages in community development. Maybe their headquarters is in a particular area and they purposely put their headquarters in an area that has a lot of low socioeconomic activity to try to increase economic development in that area. It also considers things like diversity and anti-bias issues. Benefits are a big piece of the social criteria as well, benefits and pay, their labor relations, and how they deal with workplace safety, and if they prioritize that in their processes. So those are some of the, the social aspects for ESG criteria. And then corporate governance has to do with how they contribute to politics, how they compensate their executives, how diverse their board might be or their, their top leadership might be, what their anti-corruption policies are, and if they engage in audits to try to recognize where there is corruption in their, in their businesses. And they might also consider the board's independence to make decisions as well. So there's all these different things that, that go into ESG criteria. And ESG criteria are becoming more prevalent in discussions of investment managers and brokers and what they are looking at when they're making decisions on how to manage portfolios. So Andrea, can you talk a little bit about what divesting means and what role does that divesting play when it comes to SRI? Yes. So divesting is kind of the act of no, no longer investing in a particular organization, company, stock, whatever, practice. It doesn't have to be specific to investing, but usually it's, it's related to investing. So Webster's Dictionary or Oxford Language's Dictionary definition is to rid oneself of something that no longer, that one no longer wants or requires such as a business interest or an investment. So that 
when you're thinking about, let's say your investment portfolio and you're you're looking at what types of things are in your investment portfolio and you identified that one of the companies that you bought 10 years ago or the stocks you bought 10 years ago, the company is doing things that don't align with your values. You can sell that or divest from it in order to make your portfolio more representative of who you are as a person or how you kind of view your values when it comes to supporting the market and what you want the world to look like. So to bring it kind of full circle, right? Like I opened up talking about how our spending could change the world. And this is talking about how our not spending or not investing in something can also help change the world. So very interesting. Do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share with us? I think that that we've touched on a lot of key elements that we're going to be discussing in more depth in the webinar on the 29th. I think the one thing that's probably more prevalent or going to be more prevalent in the webinar is the role that mindfulness can play in helping us to be intentional with our purchases, um, especially because when we're making financial decisions, we're kind of at the mercy of what's currently it in our market. And that doesn't always give us a lot uh, of choice, right? And so I think that understanding that if we feel shame about a purchase, it doesn't make us a bad person, right? If, if, you've, if you've engaged in purchases in the past, or if you've made mistakes with your finances that don't, don't feel like they align with who you want to be or how you view yourself, it's okay. You can get past it. There are lots of tools available to help you cope with that. Maybe money shame that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean you're a bad person just because you feel bad about something. So I think that that is probably the biggest thing is our our financial decisions and our habits They're very complicated and it's hard to change your habits. It's hard to establish new behaviors. And there are ways that you can uh, cope with the challenges of making those changes or cope with things that you have felt are mistakes in the past. Thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate um, you taking the time. Let me interview you on this subject. I find it very interesting. Um, Hopefully all of our listeners did too. And hopefully we'll see you guys on that webinar. And if not, that link we'll post in the show notes. It's always available at a later time as well, that if you can't make it live, you could still watch it. And as always, please like and subscribe to Making Sense of Money wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you guys.